Now I'm going to talk about how to actually make those resolutions come true. In the American Indian culture, there's an old saying attributed to them that says, you cannot leave a footprint in a moving stream. Think about that. You cannot leave a footprint in a moving stream. Why? Because everything gets washed away. Unless you make a really big splash, unless you make a really big impact. You don't have to be in a big position. You don't have to be the president or a senator or invent the smartphone or come up with a cure for cancer. You can have an impact in your own life. That's why you've heard me say many times, I want you to star in your own life. Now, you may be thinking, geez, lighten up. We're just talking about New Year's resolutions. I've already said that. If a New Year's resolution is just something you kind of, you know, laugh about over eggnog and you yuck it up and say, yeah, I'm going to do A, B, and C, fine, that, that's okay. Then none of this matters to you. But if you're one of those who says, you know what, just one time a year that I really stop and think about if I do want to make some changes in my life, and it just happens to be on New Year's, it could be on July 17th, I don't care. But when you do stop to think about that, and say you want to make a change, I just want you to think about this. You're the only you in the history of the world. And I guess with that, I think, comes some responsibility to be the best you that you can be. So if you're not really interested in making change, then you don't need to listen to this right now. Come back to it sometime when you do want to make the change, or tell somebody that does want to make a change to listen to it. But if you want to be a better you, then you do want to listen to this. And I can tell you right now, a simple test to determine whether you're ready for change or not, because there are four stages for readiness and change. Four stages for readiness with regard to change. Stage number one is when you're doing it because some authority makes you do it. You get in a fight and you get arrested for disturbing the peace. So you go to court and the court says, well, I'm going to order you into a 12-week anger management program. And you're rolling your eyes and, oh, yeah, fine, beats paying a fine, so okay, I'll go. What's the chance that somebody in that circumstance is going to really improve their temper? Probably not very good. They're not motivated. They don't want to be there. They can go in there and sit there and cross their arms, lean back in their chair for their hour, 12 weeks in a row. They fill the square, check the box, they're out of there. They're not motivated to learn. They're not a sponge soaking up information. They're just there because they were ordered to be. Okay, that's stage number one. Stage number two is when you're doing it to please someone else. It's like your spouse wants you to do something. They want you to get more exercise, or they want you to lose weight, or they want you to be less harsh with your family members or something, and so you agree to it. But you're doing it just to make them happy. You don't really think you have a problem but you agree to it just to make them happy to get them off of your back. So again, motivation is missing. You're just doing it to please somebody else. Stage three is when your heart's not in it, but at least intellectually, you know that you need to do it. You don't want to do it, but at least intellectually, you know that you need to do it. There's a big difference between wanting to do it and knowing that you need to do it. Maybe you want to want to, but you don't want to. You wish you did. You wish your heart was in it, and in your head, you know, yeah, it'd probably be better if I did this differently, but I'm just not, right now, that's just not on my list of things to do. So in your head, you know it, but in your heart, you're just not really into it. And then there's stage four. Nobody makes lasting change until they're in stage four. Stage four is when you are ready mentally and emotionally to make a change. You are motivated at a heart level to make a change. That's when you look in a mirror and say, I'm not taking this from myself for another day, for another hour, for another minute will I accept this from myself. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how scary it is on the other side of the wall. I'm going through the wall. I am so sick of this. I am so sick of myself. I'm so sick of my excuses. I'm so sick of my reality. I don't care what the risks are. I'm making this change. That's when people make changes. That's when people get off of drugs. That's when people lose weight. That's when people change jobs. That's when people stop venting their temper. That's when people get an education instead of continuing in a dead-end job they don't like. 
that's when people make whatever change it is in stage four of readiness. And you got to ask yourself, am I really ready? Is this a priority to me? Do I approach this with urgency? Am I so sick to death of this? You have to first assess where you are. And you can do that by asking yourself the following questions. First, why is this behavior change-worthy? The behavior resolving to change. Your resolution. Why is it change-worthy? Why does it deserve to be on your list? Certainly, why does it deserve to be on the top of your list? Why? Is it creating pain, distance, unhealthiness? What is it creating? Question two, what pain is this creating in your life or somebody's life that you want it to stop? Then three, what is blocking you from having what you want? Is it something within? Is it a damaged personal truth? Is it lack of access? Is it physical limitations? What is it? What's blocking you? Question four is really part of question three, so it could be 3B. I'll just call it four. If there's something blocking you, who or what needs to be removed from the equation? If you want to have a close relationship with your mother, but since you got married, you can't because your spouse just is threatened by it, well, that's blocking you from having a healthy relationship with your mother. That's not reasonable. So you've got to remove that obstacle. So your spouse is going to have to get their ducks in a row and get secure enough for you to have a relationship with your own mother, or they may need to leave the equation. But if you really want this, if it's urgent enough that it went on your list, you need to say who or what needs to be removed from the path in order for me to get what I want. And then the last question you need to ask yourself, and this is really, really important, how will I feel if I have it? If you achieve your resolution, how are you going to feel if you have it? This is important because you need to make sure you're wanting the right thing. Ask yourself, if I achieve my resolution, if I get what it is that I'm saying I want, how am I going to feel? Am I going to feel relief? Am I going to be proud? Am I going to be excited, satisfied? And if the answer is, wow, I don't know. I'm not sure that's going to give me what I'm looking for then maybe you need to revise your goal. Make sure that what you want is going to get you what you think it's going to get you. For example, I've talked to people that said, I just have a terrible self-image, and so I want to get plastic surgery. Well, is plastic surgery going to change your internal dialogue? Eh, Maybe, maybe not. I tend to think we need to deal with psychological problems psychologically, medical problems medically, spiritual problems spiritually, familial problems familially. I think we need to stay in our lane. Can't tell you how many people have had a poor self-image and got plastic surgery and still had a poor self-image. I think that's sad when I see that. So you got to make sure that you're wanting the right thing. And there are two things in life that you are in total control of. And that's your attitude and your effort. Those are two things you always control, your attitude and your effort. So you want to choose a goal that, whether you achieve it or not, is a function of your attitude and your effort that will make you feel so much better. And I promise you, plastic surgery is not going to fix your self-esteem. Eckhart Tolle said the primary cause of unhappiness is never the situation, but your thoughts about it. You know, you've heard me say, it's not reality that you respond to, it's what you say to yourself about reality. Eckhart's saying the same thing. Primary cause of unhappiness is never the situation, but your thoughts about it. I'm going to give you some questions that go with, out with the old and in with the true. These are things you need to ask yourself and be really, really honest about. What characteristics am I carrying with me from one situation to the next? Do I go into situations expecting a negative outcome? Think about that. Do you go in there just thinking, this ain't going to work? Do I go into situations with a chip on my shoulder? Am I so judgmental that I condemn people in situations the moment I arrive? I just, here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Am I so angry and embittered that I spew ugliness on everyone I engage? Am I so insecure that I look for and find examples of how I am mistreated in every situation? Am I so passive and unwilling to claim my space that I invite people to overlook and disrespect me? 
Avery and London don't. They're not wallflowers. They walk up to people and say, hello, my name's Avery. Good to meet you. That does not invite people to overlook them. Do I hide insecurity behind a wall of false superiority and arrogance? Now think about that. Don't you know people that do that? They're really insecure, but they come across with an air of false superiority and arrogance. But if you ever said boo, they would just fall apart. Do I try so hard that I wear people out with my overreaching? Do I spend all my time comparing myself to other people? Do I cheat myself out of genuinely experiencing situations by worrying the entire time about how people are viewing me? Have I doomed key relationships in my life by judging and condemning myself and others? I'm going to put those on the website also, because I want you to be honest with people about who you are, what you want, and how you expect to be treated. If you engage people with standards, there's just a price of poker to be in your life. If you engage people with standards, you only scare off people that are not meant for you. If you all of a sudden start saying, you're going to have to treat me with dignity and respect, and people are like, oh, well, listen, I was willing for you to stay around until you start making demands. You start expecting me to treat you with dignity and respect. Those people weren't meant for you. You have to always know the difference between what you're getting and what you deserve. Always know the difference between what you're getting and what you deserve. And if there's a big gap there, you need to change out some of the people in your life. So I'm telling you, if you want your New Year's resolution to really be a changing force in your life, make the decision, the life decision, that you really do want to change it. Decide you're so sick of your crap you're not going to take it anymore. Make a plan, have a strategy, get excited about it, and then identify the seven-step strategy that you need to get from where you are to where you need to be. And like I said, you got to shake it up to break it up. If you want different, you've got to do different. The most overquoted statement I've ever heard from the world of psychology is that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's probably overquoted so much because it applies to so many of us. We just keep doing the same thing over and over and over, and then we're stunned when we don't get different results. So if you want different, do different. I've got two very long-time close friends. These guys are really more family than friends. They're here for a specific reason. Dr. Patrick DeFazio was born and raised in Niagara Falls on the Canadian side, the Ontario side. He completed his pre-med studies at Brock University in Canada and received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of the State of New York. He graduated with honors in 1988 from Parker University College of chiropractic in my hometown, Dallas, Texas. He was the founding father, director of athletics, and also served on the Academic Standards Committee. He's a supervising doctor for the University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles. Really is experienced in treating sports injuries, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today. He's got patients in all the professional sports, NFL, NHL, MLB, PGA, and we'll talk about his approach in just a minute. Also with me is my good friend, Dave Fabrizio. He's a physical therapist. His physical therapy and sports medicine career started in the United States Air Force. He graduated cum laude from Cleveland State University with a Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy. He did internships at the top medical facilities in the Cleveland area, including the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and he treats all kinds of populations, acute, cardiac, neurological patients, orthopedic, sports medicine as well. He was selected as one of the two physical therapists at the Great Lakes, what was the whole name of that? Great Lakes Regional Rehab Center. Yeah, yeah. up there, and he's qualified to teach biomechanics, ergonomics, and back school. I was really impressed that He's got a 1,000 hours in athletic training rooms across the country in both college with high school athletics and has a real diverse and in-depth understanding of kinesiology 
and abnormal movement patterns. So welcome, both of you. I'm glad you guys are sitting down with me today. We're at the top of the year, and the number one resolution is what? Everybody wants to be healthy, live a healthier life, start exercising. People say that, but then they don't stick with it. Or they say it, and they overdo it, and they injure themselves. And right now, you see people get off the couch, have heart attacks, shovel in snow. Come spring, you see people get off the couch and get into softball leagues. They pull hamstrings. They blow out knees. They do all sort of things like that. Now we've got pickleball, which I'm a big fan. I think pickleball is a great thing, get people active. But they're getting off the couch, and they're blowing out shoulders and all sort of things in pickleball. So I thought it was a good time to talk to people about, let's do this right. We want activity. We want to do it right. Dave, why are people getting injured so much? Well, it's funny you mentioned pickleball because I've had so many patients over the last few years. You probably have too, but, you know, they're they're going into this and and it's such a fun game that everybody, regardless, because there's there's limited movements, so people that aren't really great athletes are still able to do it, right? And they love it. But the, but the problem is there has to be a certain level of conditioning going into it so that your, your tendons are able to absorb the force. Like I see a lot of rotator cuff inflammation from people because they're, they're basically, uh, they're going at it like crazy with that ball. There's not much weight to the ball and, and they're straining their shoulders. So I think the key is um, if you're going to, if you're going to try and get into these activities, there's a certain amount of mobility you have to have, flexibility and strength and stability. So doing rotator cuff stuff and some scapular stabilization work, stuff like that, so that your shoulders better able to withstand that. A lot of people might think about this from a generation ago, but modern chiropractic is a lot different than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. You're a big believer in people strengthening their core because you see a lot of back injuries, a lot of back aches, a lot of neck problems and stuff. And what we're talking about keeps people from having those kind of problems. Correct. Right now, we have an incredible amount of scientific evidence to show the benefit of keeping the body as possibly aligned as possible, keeping the flexibility in the body and then the strengthening. When you combine flexibility with strength, it's, it's more difficult to be injured. The body can then be attuned to perform at an optimum level. Now, we've got the average person, like you say, are they a coach potato or are they, you know, an Olympic athlete? So where in the spectrum does that individual fall? Uh, we can be great bodybuilders or great weightlifters, and we can go swim 10 laps, in a, you know, 40 foot long pool, and our, our body sore as heck for the next two or three days because they're muscles we don't normally use. So what I have found is that at what do you want to perform and is there a little bit of conditioning you can do five, seven minute warm up before you play that activity? We're talking in particular about pickleball. So what, as Dave was the same, what are some exercises we can do to strengthen and also to increase flexibility for that arm? We don't normally perform an arm length strain in, in everyday life. So when we're going to do that activity and we put pivot with rotation, you're going to be more prone to injury. If there's some basic exercises, as Dave said, you know, wise tees and something on YouTube you can look at and or simple basic exercise you do daily, you have now activated those muscles. They have the memory within them. So when you go to perform that activity, such as the pickleball, it's not so strenuous on that arm, not so strenuous on the shoulder or that joint. Less prone to injury. Yeah. And that's the thing. When we do some of these sports activities, and a lot of people are listening to us right now while they're walking. You know, they're going out for their morning walk. They've got their earbuds in. They've hit podcasts, fill in the blanks, and they're playing while they're walking. Walking is something we do every day. It's an activity of daily living. So that's not an issue. But when they go to play a sport, whether it be softball or tennis or pickleball or golf or whatever, you're doing rotations and things. They're not activities of daily living. So we're doing rotations and extensions and things that we don't do every day, and our body is not accustomed to it. Our tendons and our ligaments and our muscles and stuff, we're asking the body to do things it doesn't do every day. And that's where we've got to start doing range of motion, strength and stuff, so we don't wind up injuring ourselves. Exactly. You don't have to be an athlete to exercise. You don't have to be an athlete to get your body in the best shape that it can be. A lot of people are athletes, and you'll go to the track down at the high school, 
and you'll see somebody there that ran track at some college or something, and he or she's whipping around the track and stuff, and I'm going like, yeah, let me tell you. You ever see me running through the neighborhood? Shoot whoever is directly behind me, because <laughs> I'm not jogging. <laughs> I'm escaping. Somebody's chasing me. I hate jogging. I expend more energy doing something I enjoy, like playing tennis. I would never do that on a treadmill. I would never do it on the street. My knees wouldn't let me do that. But on a tennis court, I'll put out the energy, the effort, because I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the camaraderie, the guys that I'm hanging with. I enjoy the competition. I enjoy trying to perfect the strokes and hitting the ball, that sort of thing. But the repetition of just getting on the road and running down the road, it's like, oh, God, kill me now. I wouldn't do yeah. it. Some studies say only 8% of people keep their resolutions by the middle of February. Hmm. And the way to overcome that is set your environment up to support your goals. You know, you know, uh, I keep, this keeps coming to my, uh, into my head as you're talking. I'm sure Pat will back this up. But because of the COVID pandemic, um, the number of patients I had coming in with neck and back problems from sitting, computers all day long, television, you know, did you see an increase in, in neck and low back? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd see the ones that were coming in pre-COVID, they came in with a different condition. <laughs> and the ones that uh, were, you know, like had back problems come in on neck problems or more at the computer. They're going, why, why are you having neck problems? Is you weren't having this before you worked at a computer from work. Well, I'm on my bed and it's a flip top and I go in different positions and I'm looking down. Okay, well, we That's have to set up your ergonomics. You have to set the proper table. Well, I'm at my dining room table or kitchen table and the chair is not really that good and it's too high or too low. And so the, the, the dynamics, the biomechanics are, ergonomics are poor. So you have to set up that station. And I just like what you're saying that. And it just, it's the safety and you got to do what you like. But, but, but the other thing about that though, is during the pandemic, a lot of people were less active. Some yes. people took it the opposite direction. Also a great chance to go hiking and get That was for up, me. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But, but, but I, I think the majority of the people were fearful to go out. So they became less active, which to your point, become active. Go for a walk, yeah. like you're saying. I think walking Sorry. is one of the greatest, easiest things anyone can do. Now, when it's cold outside, okay, up in the north, wintertime, how am I going to go outside? It's cold. Well, once again, you can go to go to the internet and you can do certain activities, whether it's a yoga class or something for 15, 20 minutes, you know, uh, activities that you can do that are still very, very healthy for you and enjoyable. Set it. When are you going to do it? In the morning, afternoon, evening, you have children. What's the, What's the plan? Take care of yourself is all I'm saying. As we go into this, I wanted to hear from you guys. I love what y'all are saying about getting functionally ready for what you're doing and not blowing yourself out as you get into these activities. We're in wintertime now, but we're going to be through this in no time and getting back out there. And now is a good time. If you're up in the Northeast or even in the Northwest right now and you've got cabin fever, great time to start building your core. Great time to start doing some of these functional exercises to get yourself ready to get out. And for God's sakes, don't have a heart attack shoveling snow. That's an intensity that we're just not ready for. You know, in the sports medicine world, there's what's called specificity of training. So if I'm going to do a certain movement playing tennis, basketball, what have you, you want to try and incorporate activities that are going to lean toward improving that skill set. The second thing that I see is, is uh, you have to take in mind adaptation. And I can't tell you the number of patients, I'm sure you can agree with this, um, that come in and, and they're doing the same routine, the same number of sets, the same weights for years, right? So at that point, your body's not going to adapt. So if you're going to slowly increase your walking time, you have to slowly increase the time. You can't keep it at 15 minutes and expect that to improve unless you add hills to it or you add increased cadence or walking faster. Um, and you have, to, you, have to, you have to have goals in mind of how you're going to progress that activity. And that's really key. And listen to your body. If something's hurting you, don't do the same thing the next day. Give yourself a day off, rest. Yeah, Feel brave. yeah do something different. The key, once again, it's, it's, it's what you think, what you eat, and what you do. You've got to have body movement, okay, at, at, at any age. As much, and you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to inflame the areas. What you're eating, as you said, if you don't like it, you don't eat it. Is there portion control? And then what you're thinking, if you're having a plan and you're in control, you said, Phil, of your life, and you are the master of how you're going to do it, 
now you're doing it and is it enjoyable? It's sustainable. It's sustainable and it's effective and you feel better about yourself. Now, as you're doing those things, and as Dave said, you change activities, you add times, you change and you can modify what you're doing specifically to that activity that you're doing. If I want to swim a lot, all right, what are swimming exercises I can do? Here's you look them up on the internet, look over to the YouTube, whatever you can do to help increase your strength and flexibility so you can perform that activity to a higher level and then you'll feel a greater form of accomplishment for yourself. Well, you guys live what you preach. I got to say, we've been working together for 20 years. I've watched you guys practice what you preach. You take care of yourselves and me. So I'm glad. 